So welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. This is part two of our conversations about badges. Um, it is August 15th, 2012, and we have a few people who were with us last time. And thank you for coming back. And um, some people um, in, in addition, we Doug Belshaw in Northumberland uh, was uh, we're having the show a little bit early so he can join us. Uh, welcome, Doug. Well. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, um, and we have a homeschooling mother, Amy Leewerk. Did I say that correctly? Close enough. No. Barry jo <laughs> Thank you. Barry Joseph from, um, from Global Kids. Um, Doug uh, is with, uh, since July, he said, is with um, the Mozilla Foundation. Got a couple of teachers who are still joining us from the Epstein uh, School, where um, Barry has been doing some work. Monica Hardy is joining us as well. I'm Paul Allison, and Peter uh, Rostor is with us. And finally, Amy. Amy, I'm sorry, Amy. That's funny. Cheryl Grant is with us as well. Do, never mind on that. Uh, welcome, Cheryl, with your hat and all. <laughs> To, to join us. And we have Samuel Abramovich, who's doing some research on all of this um, from uh, an institute at the University of Pittsburgh. So welcome, everybody. Um, don't know exactly how we're going to get going here, but um, there were a couple suggestions in the pre-show that at the end, um, and I got some comments and some emails and uh, that said, wow, this badges thing looks interesting, but what is it? Um, so it, it's it's a really interesting conversation that has taken off, and we kind of jumped into the middle of it last week. So I think it's a good suggestion for somebody to say, what are badges? Um, and Doug has a, what he's called an elevator pitch. Uh, so maybe we could throw it to you. Introduce yourself a little bit more, Doug. And, yes, uh, um, I'm Doug um, I'm Badges and Skills Lead for the Mozilla Foundation, which means that um, I do stuff around web literacies and I evangelize open badges. Um, for those of you who are listening to this on the podcast, I'm currently using the Google Effects and have a daft pirate hat on and some sunglasses, which is why some people are snickering at me. So you want to go look at the video right away. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to take off so people take me seriously, otherwise um, no one else. But anyway, there we are. So, um, open badges. I did listen to last week's podcast, which was really interesting, some really valuable and thoughtful critique. So even though I am kind of a, a badges evangelist, um, I, am, I used to be a teacher, used to be director of e-learning, um, I used to work for JISC in the UK, um, so I'm kind of aware of all different sectors of formal education in the UK, um, and I do take on board some of those critiques. But I, I didn't feel like last week we had a um, a definition or um, a sense of what a badge is to start off with. So, um, a digital badge is something which you can display on the web, either on your website, on Facebook, or LinkedIn, or anywhere where you can put stuff. Um, but it's not just um, a PNG image. It's more than that. It's got some metadata built into it. Um, and that metadata is data about data. So it includes various parts. So it includes, for example, um, who issued the badge and who it was issued to. Um, and those two things are important because it means that someone else can't just steal your badge and pass it off as their own. Because as soon as you click on it, you'll see who it was issued to. Um, but then there's a third bit which is really important. It's actually optional, but I think it's really important. And that's the evidence URL. So you can click on it and you can see what that user, that earner, had to do in order to earn that badge. Because badges are always earned. They're not just given out like stickers. Someone has to do something. Um, so that's kind of um, a, a, what an open badge is. It's an it's a image file with metadata baked into it. But then there's something called the Open Badges Infrastructure. And that's what Mozilla is building. It's quite, um, shortened to the OBI. Um, and, and what Mozilla are doing is building an open source um, technical system which people can use to plug in their own badge kind of mini ecosystems. So if you want to use the OBI, um, what you do is you look at all the specifications, and Peter is doing a wonderful job in, in helping people understand how to start doing that. Um, and when you do that, it means that you can put these badges in what's called a badge backpack, um, and you can display these or uh, however you want on different websites. You can keep them to yourselves. You can group them however you want as well. Um, 
and instead of them just being locked into your own, say, school or university or organization's ecosystem, they're displayable across the web, and, and that's the important thing here. So Mozilla is building an open source ecosystem um, which allows you to display these open badges, these metadata encoded images um, across the web. And the idea is that that's going to eventually produce a system which can unlock um, achievements and privileges and potentially job opportunities as well. Okay. Great. Anybody want to add or question? Or? I think that was, that was a great uh, introduction to the topic, Doug. I think what I might add is some of the various things that we've seen for why people would even want to use this system. What is it for? Some people use all the things that I'm going to describe. Some people you pick and choose depending on what they need. There's essentially six things that I give a, a quick overview to. The first one is that a lot of people are interested in badges uh, as a form of alternative assessment, as a way to give you feedback, whether in a formalized learning environment, in ways they don't usually get feedback, or in an informal place, like where I work at Global Kids, where we don't give youth grades, for example. But this, is a, this would be a fantastic way to give them feedback about the leadership skills they learn in one of our programs. The second area has to do with uh, gaming and how badges in a gaming context provide a way to engage young people through, through a process and how we can gamify education, so to speak, by bringing over badges into that context, into a, uh, an educational learning context, and be able to take what has worked so well in a gaming space and then have it be connected to learning. A third area has to do with um, providing learning scaffoldings, because once you have a digital system that a youth can use to provide evidence of what they're learning and where they're learning. There are now things that an educational system can offer to help young people learn different pathways through that learning environment so that youth can learn on their own schedule and in their on their own individual interest trajectories. And so those kind of learning scaffoldings is something that badges can offer. The fourth area is to use badges as a way to help develop lifelong learning skills, which in parts means understanding your learning ecology. Where are all the different places that you learn? How do you strengthen the ones that are important to you? How do you build new ones? How do you navigate them? How do you use the resources that are there? These are all things that youth need to be uh, to develop um, lifelong learning skills, and badges can be a way to help provide that. It can give you language around the skills they're learning when right now they're just things that they think they're doing having fun, for example. Uh, number five is a lot of people think about badges as a way to open up uh, in learning environments, ways to access what digital media can offer. It becomes an, an entry point to provide uh, all the, the vast affordances that the digital media allow. And finally, six is democratizing the educational space. Uh, badges aren't just things that, for example, teachers should give young people or the authorities should give. They become something that the people who are in the badging systems themselves help shape and, and can even become authorized to give to others. So from us at Global Kids, these six perspectives of what we've seen have become kind of like a good overview, of, although it's not definitive, of the reasons why people want to use digital badging systems. Wow. Okay. Well, we can play that in slow motion, and we'll get that all done. <laughs> well, let's break some of this out. Um, you know, I, I, but, but can I just, I just want to say that um, I don't remember there being a, a sort of movement that's had um, so much kind of contests and, but, but also really good theory and thought and, um, I don't know, structure. I, 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 but there seems like a lot more of that than there is about implementation, teachers actually doing this in their classrooms yet. There's a very so, good reason for that. There's a very, very good reason for that. But well, we do have is, some teachers here who are doing that, so I want to introduce okay. them after you give that reason, Doug. Go ahead. <laughs> um, the reason for that is because um, you can speculate and theorize about stuff that doesn't yet exist or is about to exist. So a lot of the tools and a lot of the stuff that we can do, for example, version 1.0 of the OBI, um, and a very simple lightweight, lightweight way to issue badges um, is kind of still a couple of months off. So um, there's still a lot of theory and speculation about what you can do. Um, and one of the comments which I found really interesting last week was people saying um, uh, it's all very well kind of theorizing and stuff, but where is the where are the examples? Well, it's quite kind of hard to have the examples when we haven't got the the easy to use tools yet. And um, there are tools there. Mm -hmm. um, there's a WordPress plugin, for example, but it's still not like painfully simple to, simple to use. Um, so, yeah, that's that. We um, wanted to interrupt just a minute. I'm from the Epstein what? School, and we are the examples. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sam can speak to that uh, in a little bit, because I'm obviously biased, but he prepared a nice 
exploratory case study with some researchers from Penn State who visited our school. So I'll let Sam say a little bit more about us and then I'll interrupt and brag a little bit more. Sounds good. You're going to introduce the Epstein School. Sam, go ahead. Introduce yourself first. Sure. My name is Sam Abramovich and I'm a researcher from the University of Pittsburgh and I had the, uh, the uh, pleasure of working with Epstein and Barry at Global Kids and looking at uh, Epstein's implementation of a bad system. And just to kind of to uh, follow up on Doug's comments too is that uh, uh, what's interesting about the uh, educational research space is that uh, there have been kind of this long cycle in history of educational innovations and transformations, and they've all been, you know, uh, had ups and downs, and it's always been a struggle for research to prove that. And what's unique and interesting about badges is that they're kind of a coming at the right point in history with the right kind of design to perhaps really potentially be something fairly unique and new to the uh, to uh, education and learning in which that they're capitalizing on all this kind of research and understanding we know but also kind of technology and also at this time and point where people are very receptive to changing the educational system and the Epstein's school system and, and uh, I don't want to I mean really Epstein should talk about it and Barry also should really talk about this but um, what they represented through a lot of hard work and a lot of innovation uh, what ex what happened was, from an outside researcher's perspective, was a, a, a mature badging system where students uh, elected through kind of a self-driven interest to follow up, learn, master uh, skills that normally aren't traditionally part of schooling. And I mean that in the general United States, you know, K through 12 schooling sense. But uh, the badges kind of really allowed them to facilitate and create uh, learning opportunities that normally don't exist. And so that just kind of it builds off of what Doug was saying earlier. But I didn't want to restrict it. It's always hard to uh, get people to learn. That is, by its definition, something incredibly hard. And so examples of like what's going on at Epstein and other examples too, you know, are all very difficult. But that's what makes them kind of all the more special is that when uh, they, they do exist and have those kind of learning examples. So, but I, I feel like Barry, maybe you want, would you like to describe Epstein and then maybe Epstein should describe maybe Catherine or Leora? Well, I see Myrna's here, who's the principal. Um, I, I, I always defer to her to talk about the school. And so, so perhaps an introduction might be if we can ask you, Myrna, to talk about the school and why you guys were even interested in having something like digital badging systems in your school environment. Okay, I was having trouble getting on, so I'm using Leora. What? Okay, sorry. Um, hi, I'm Myrna Rubel, principal of the middle school here, and um, we looked at badges a little differently from the beginning. One, looking at it as an opportunity to um, showcase students uh, and give them optional opportunities to do something fun and interesting. Fun and interesting is always good in middle school. Um, secondly, I looked at it as an opportunity to do some serious staff development um, using technology in an innovative way, but also working with teachers who work with middle school kids and coming up with the values that we think are important. And I did listen to last week's podcast last night, and uh, I don't remember who it was who said knowing a community's values was really important before you jumped into this. And we as a staff had to articulate what we wanted our eighth graders to really to have before they left our school and what was really important to us. So with Barry's help, we had a few sessions in staff development. Um, but for us, what was key is having an optional program. Um, and I kind of agree with the people from last week who were a little scared of standardizing badges and, and putting grades and everything on it. That really wouldn't work for us. Our kids chose to participate. And even today, when we introduced the new sixth graders to it, almost half the class got really excited because um, it's new, it's fun, it's interesting, um, and it's not pencil and paper. Mm -hmm. Leora, you want to back up or say anything? Catherine? From the yep. teacher perspective? <laughs> Sorry, I, ha I was having to unmute my microphone. I was trying to make sure we didn't get reverb here. Um, 
I really think the t kids like it because it allows them to show those aspects of themselves specifically that we're not testing. So the students that aren't the athletes but are really great with their computers have another way of showing mastery of a skill. So it is a, a variation of differentiation, only they're choosing what they get to develop, what skills they develop, what skills that we, we've set some targets. These are the things we'd like them to show, but they choose what they're going to show how they're going to show it, where's the evidence in their own interest areas. And it's really helping us with sort of executive functioning skills, though I think we can say not in the way we hoped it would, um, <laughs> not necessarily in the order that an adult would approach it, but we set up things that we wanted the kids to master, and they're showing mastery in ways we had not anticipated. And to, I guess to complete the full background, as Doug had mentioned, one of the reasons why we're getting so much attention now on badging systems is that we finally are starting to have tools. Global Kids has been using badges for many years, but it was just things we kludged together. And in fact, midway during the year, we switched them from something we'd built over to the, the badge system, which was quite strong and very effective. But when we started working with Epstein, funded by the, the Covenant Foundation that funds Jewish educational uh, projects, we weren't sure what it would look like to use badges, which we had been using in informal learning spaces, to be used inside a school. And so the frame was very explicitly around how could a school use a badging system to help young people connect the informal learning they were experiencing outside the school with what they were doing inside the school, to both make a context within the school that valued what they were doing outside the school, and at the same time to help them ground and make connections with what they were doing in the school. And that in some ways was informing and helped shape Sam and his team and his study. Sam, do you want to share a little bit now about what you guys found, or do you want to save that for later? No, I, I'd be happy to share it now. I think it's perfect. Um, and so, uh, you know, knowing that there was this kind of robust, kind of well-developed badging system that had you know, student participation, had all the kind of ingredients that you would expect a learning opportunity to have, uh, to have effective learning, we stepped in, you know, me and some colleagues from the University of Pittsburgh and uh, Florida State. We, uh, you know, as uh, education researchers, we have the, you know, the burden, so to speak, of not, uh, of impartiality, of going in and kind of looking to see whether something's working, whether it's not working. So we had some th certain theoretical lenses that we wanted to, to apply to the badging system. What we were able to, uh, to do by applying these theoretical lenses is find uh, really five unique ways in which the Epstein badge system and what we think badge systems in general, at least when, when properly implemented, uh, how they can kind of capitalize and uh, help students learn uh, in ways that is not traditionally done or ways that are just very difficult to do. And we kind of isolated them as everything from, you know, enjoyment and uh, independence of learning opportunities to uh, uh, interconnection with student value system, their ability for uh, students to re receive recognition you know, in addition to feedback for their learning, uh, for students to be able to establish a personal connection uh, to their learning process through a badging system, and then also, you know, the reward aspect, which is a, traditionally a very controversial aspect of uh, learning, right? The idea that uh, rewards can uh, impair or even, you know, uh, slow down learning, but uh, badges seem to be something very different and unique, and uh, we were able to find very strong evidence at Epstein for uh, all these different categories and uh, are hoping to kind of continue our research and really unpack as to what uh, is unique about a, a badge system and how it really promotes learning. All right, could I invite Amy in to the conversation? Um, uh, just because I don't know when we'll get you in here. <laughs> but it, it's, it's so, I mean, it's so hard to have both, but I think this is actually true in, in, the, in the field in general. I think it's really hard to get what get your head around what these what this badge system is, and kind of be thoughtful and critical at the same time. Right. But, so that's what we're trying to do here to this afternoon right. tonight. I guess like um, Samuel was just saying that they had collected evidence, you know, in support of the badge system, and I was wondering if he had any um, anything in particular that he could share, like. Successes that they had with the kids at the school, or you know that kind of thing. I'm I'm still wrapping my head around it in the context of having been a Girl Scout <laughs> once upon a time and having a, a kid who learns because he wants to and not because there's a badge at the end of it. So, 
Yeah, but I, I, I can't hear how it's working. <laughs> sure, and, and I think the important thing to understand is that, you know, I mean, you know, even going back to what Doug was saying earlier is that, uh, you know, badge, you know, to, it's a very kind of difficult concept sometimes to wrap one's head around the idea of badges simply because uh, they can manifest their, uh, themselves in very different ways. You can have everything from like a long-term badge, right, that represents, you know, a culminating, so to speak, mastery of a certain skill or knowledge base. You can have short-term kind of, you know, smaller badges, which, are, you know, represent kind of, you know, increasing feedback. And I think one of the ways that we've tried to... Uh, kind of explain and understand badges is looking at two originations. One, um, uh, Amy, that you just mentioned, like the scouting model, right? You know, the merit badge of, of Girl Scouts, of Boy Scouts, of international scouting, you know, which represents, you know, a culminating piece, right? This mastery, this concept that you have achieved, uh, you know, a certain level of knowledge, a skill set that you can demonstrate and use. And, you know, from, you know, when you wear a badge on a sash if you're a scout, you know, that is an indicator that you are, you know, a master of that particular piece of knowledge or, you, you know, you have a certain level of knowledge that you've achieved. But there's also that video game model, right, where the badge kind of represents kind of a smaller scale mastery or understanding of knowledge. And I think the interesting thing about a badge system is that it represents potential for learning and understanding on all these different levels, that it represents this, you know, this way to almost be an alternative assessment, this alternative feedback to show, okay, uh, you know, I've earned a badge, and so now I have mastery at Epstein, for instance, one of their uh, more successful badges was uh, a 21st century kind of online literacy badge. Uh, but then at the same time, you can get a smaller badge, right, that indicates, look, you know, breaking that skill set down, perhaps I have a search engine badge, right, which says I'm building toward that 21st century skill set. So there's a lot of different levels to this. Uh, and I guess tying that even back to the open badge initiative, what's, you know, interesting about the technology pieces of this, too, is that it allows uh, different people to create different badge systems at different scales, and I think maybe that is one core component that's, you know, at first sounds a little bit different. It's not an alternative assessment. This isn't alternative grading. This really is kind of a very different way. Uh, Barry's list of, like, democratizing education. You know, if you really expand the word democratizing, you might be able to kind of get a little bit deeper into understanding badges. So I guess um, something that I'm thinking of uh, that we had discussed after being at a conference recently at MIT was the idea that like a badge shouldn't be an end point and you're talking about like all these steps on the way that you make a badge and you, and you discussed unlocking earlier I think it was during the recording um, can you expand a little bit more on that like I guess my concern would be that the system could end up being really rigid and then I think that any badging system that would be successful should be very dynamic. So, yeah, I, I mean, so I mean, if someone else would like to answer that, that's of course too, but I mean, I think, yeah, so I'll just say briefly is that I think any good kind of learning system, assessment, alternative assessment, any pedagogy is absolutely, as you described, dependent on its ability to be flexible and adjust to learners. I want to invite Peter and Cheryl to jump in if they'd like. Um, I, well, one thing, Amy, when you were talking, I've got friends who, who homeschool um, and have had conversations about badges, and one of the things that they found very interesting that's a little bit different than what people are talking about here is being able to identify the community that they belong to through the badges. So if you have after-school programs that are sort of um, a little bit all over the place, you don't have maybe the same space all the time that you're gathering like you would at a school, the idea that you could sort of have this pathway that is still very much focused on the homeschool model of, um, you know, being able to sort of seek out the learning where you want it as it fits with your child. The badges sort of allow there to be, and I overuse this word, um, but there's like a gestalt to the community. Um, and I think Barry's got some experience with that where he saw after his program, at least in one of your posts, maybe it was Daria who posted it. So there's that aspect of it that that appeals to me the most. One, one thing that I find most interesting about badges is the identity piece. Um, and I think that's a different way of talking about the motivation. Um, and I, I always link it back to reputation. So I, as a learner, 
Um, I'm much more interested in my reputation and shaping it and shaping my identity and having agency as I build my learning path. And I think that works with the homeschool model really nicely. Um, and it's sort of legitimate. It makes it more legitimate what the boundaries of that community is without actually saying this is all you get. And you're not ranked within it. It's not like you have a grade or certificate or a diploma or a degree. It's kind of a one-off. It's, it's sort of saying this community values these badges, values these behaviors or skills, um, and, and allows there to be some um, individual personalized pathways of learning through that. I don't know, I'm sure there's been a lot of research about homeschool, about how you cre create that sense of community, but I think the identity piece is really interesting. And obviously there's some assessment issues that are appealing, I think, to the homeschool community as well. Um, so I just wanted to speak specifically to your situation that I find the most interesting about badges is that sense of identity that a, a youth could say, I, I, I can show this and I actually pick this and I, I can show evidence of this. I've been evaluated and, and I sought it out. And I think that's, that's to me the most interesting part of this because you can't get that with a grade, you can't get that with a degree, you really can't get that with any of the other sort of um, badge type of things that we already have in place. Part of our helping the students buy the building and go into the identity was have the students being part of the building process of the badges. We had identified some of the key skills we wanted students to have, but they investigated our role models. They built our vokies. They helped set up our descriptions. They helped launch our program. They helped saying this, explain to the other students, this is what this value means to us and to our community. And so for them, then when they think they've earned a badge or when they're making progress, they go on VoiceThread. They say, this is what it means to me. And so a large part of it is how they identify the skill, how that matches up with what we've all established as a core value of the institution, how they think they've expressed understanding, knowledge, demonstration of that value. So even more so than in something with scouting, I, I used to be a scoutmaster where there was intrinsic. This is really much more intrinsic and has a lot more flexibility in terms of what they're going to do to model a value that is Im important to your institution. For us, we set aside Jewish role models and Jewish leaders and Jewish values because we have a common core of values as a Jewish day school. But uh, honestly, getting the students in uh, as part of the, the buy-in, as part of the foundation of establishing the program was really important to us. How, can you um, say how many badges are available to kids and, and what, first, what some of them are? And I have a multi-part question. Um, and what's, what's one that didn't work and one that really worked really well? Okay. Well, I wouldn't say didn't work. How about a postponement? We started with four. We had identified nine that we wanted to start with. And the most important to us would have been the information literacy, uh, being able to identify sources and do research appropriately, that was not the sexiest badge from a sixth grade point of view. We, we started with sixth graders. This year we've expanded, so those sixth graders who are now seventh graders have three more badges open to them and the sixth graders have the original four, so we're up to seven and we hope next year to expand it to two more. But the, the four that we had started with were information literacy, the empowered learner, who can demonstrate the ability to learn independently through preparation, self-assessment, skill assessment, and perseverance. Acceptance, which was very popular with the kids. Uh, toleration for people that are different than they are, uh, reaching out to others, and collaboration, uh, creating group solutions. And they were really popular, especially collaborating and acceptance. Not as much information literacy, which, like I said, as a teacher or, and a research teacher, yay, that's where I want them to go. But um, can you can you kind of like tell us like one of those badges like what what is the criteria for awarding that badge? Well, there are three different steps of awarding. I mean, you don't get the whole badge until you've been able to um, show that you understand it, your ability to talk about it, so you could explain it to another learner, as, as well as a teacher, and then a demonstration of a mastery, a do it. This is something that I've done that that proves that and. They had a whole, uh, started with VoiceThread and BadgeDAC where they created, uh, trying to 
make sure that I use the appropriate terms, but they presented a PowerPoint presentation on things that they had actually done. The PowerPoint in and of itself wouldn't be earning the badge, but that would be part of that. I can talk about what I've done. I was acting in a community theater, and these are some of the projects I did outside of school. Oh, for my uh, bar mitzvah, I was working to raise um, awareness of uh, this cause or that cause. One young lady was working with horses with equine therapy, so some things that we don't even know about that they're explaining to us. So there was a wild, wide range. Some of them um, had lower expectations for themselves to start with. Maybe they just said, we had Korean students come to their sc our school and I was nice to them. And they said, so that shows that I'm accepting. And we're like, well, we'd like to hear a little bit more. What do you mean you talked to them? What did you talk to them about? How did you help them you know, become more accepted in the community? So we asked for a little bit more evidence. But they set the goals for themselves. I personally want to be an accepting person. You know, it wasn't me coming to them and saying, you have to work on what we labeled um, the Ellie Wiesel acceptance badge because you have to do this before you can graduate and be a, you know, a good Jewish role model. They chose what skills they wanted to move, and then they set definitions for themselves of what it meant to be based on a rubric that we had, and we discussed it with them. And they'd say, here's my evidence. Do you think I understand it? Or how can I understand? What more can I do? So they were really coming to us telling us what they thought they had accomplished and what they wanted to show us and what they were really excited about. I, I really want to get a sense of how much the students had the opportunity to define the criteria. Like you, you were describing them, you know, identifying parts of this is the evidence and there was sort of a dialogue around the evidence, but were they engaged at the front end of that, of, of how to, what is the criteria for that? Well, when we set up the, or selected the role models, we had a group of students that had volunteered to be part of the project who actually went then and, and researched. A gr group of teachers said, for example, uh, we think Ruth Messinger is a perfect example of collaboration. So the students then went and researched Ruth Messinger. And why would we think she's a collaborator? And they created a Vokey and they posted that Vokey online to sort of get the other sixth graders involved. And then each of the sixth grade advisories, which is a group of about 12 kids went and did more research on Ruth, Ruth Messinger and they created a poster about what's so wonderful about Ruth Messinger to sort of help them and then the kids would decide how many of them wanted to we taught them the tools in terms of how to get online, how to use VoiceThread, how to use Badge Stack but whether or not to pursue a badge and go further and then see how can I grow to be more like Ruth Messinger in these ways that are uh, models of collaboration all we set up is what does it mean to talk about a skill, what does it mean to show you really understand a skill, and what does it mean to show that you really can do this. But a lot of the research was done with and by the kids, predominantly by the kids, with us just saying, could you make this a little bit clearer. So were you able to, to attach each of your badges to a person? or Each of our badges is attached to a person. Cool. So Who are this the other year, people? Oh, we well, have as, a New, as a New Yorker, I love hearing Ruth Messenger. I just want to <laughs> throw in that this was the part. Well, we lost you. Myrna, I think your mic is off. Uh, yeah, and I was starting mine off, but Myrna hadn't turned hers off. Let me turn Go off. Go ahead. Myrna, come back. We don't hear you yet. Just briefly, while wait until Myrna turns on her microphone, uh, I just wanted to say in that what was interesting in our in our research aspect is that we saw kind of indications also, very clear indications of, of that interest. And the interest, I think, one of the more fascinating things was the interest ran the gamut across participation in the badge system, which is to say that students both identified specifically with the badges that they went after, but that they also identified with the methods by which they earned the badge. Right. So. Not, not only their, you know, the actual content, the individual content of how they would go ahead and earn the badge, but even like the fact that they would choose, let's say, a video blog, or they would, you know, selecting, you know, particular examples to kind of, you know, almost create a portfolio to earn their badge. They identified their process too as important of, as having relevance to themselves. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, so um, for me, the adventure really began with staff, as I said before, with staff development. Um, 
getting the teachers to do the buy-in, knowing that they would have to do most of the work, and getting them motivate, motivated to sustain through the whole year. And the surprise came when the teachers themselves said, why don't we attach contemporary Jewish role models to the badges um, to make this a little bit more of a sexier project? Because over the years, we have done something called echoes of people throughout our history who have influenced and made an echo or a ripple through time. And so you asked, Paul, the names of the badges. We used. Um, uh, Sergey Brin from Google to be the informational literacy and of course the kids got a big chuckle out of that. Ruth Messinger for collaborating, Ellie Wiesel for acceptance, Alana Kagan as the empowered learner. Um, the only, I think, there were, there were only two deceased people, um, Golda Meir for leadership um, and Abraham Joshua Heschel for Jewish ethics, but we also used Rubik for the play badge, and um, Steven Spielberg for communication. So those were the titles, and actually the teachers went through a whole um, series um, voting on, brainstorming, and voting on um, these names. And that caused a lot of excitement even at the beginning of the year. The kids who volunteered to start in the project, they came in and they got very excited by researching, oh, I did first I didn't even know this person was Jewish, but secondly, wow. Um, and that interest uh, was kept throughout the whole year. And we're really starting year two um, with the, the same kind of uh, the new kids want to know, how do we do this thing called badges? And I want to go back to, I don't know if it was Amy or the other woman, I'm not sure. It is all about identity for us. For us, it's all about middle school kids feeling um, that they have a sense of what they're capable of achieving, taking risks to go out of their boundaries to try something new and be proud of their achievements, those both in school and out of school. And not to mention also working with the teachers. We've set up groups, 10 teachers this year volunteered to be on the the advocate with a student, each teacher volunteered to be on a badge committee um, to give positive feedback to kids about how they're preparing their voice thread and how they're achieving their badge. Can I just come in here? So, Doug, still, um, yes, please. so if I was a badge skeptic um, and I came along and, and saw what you did, which was certainly a valuable bit of learning um, and a valuable bit of um, Jewish education, what value did the badge system particularly add there? Just to make that explicit. Um, go ahead. If, it, if uh, Sam or anyone from Epstein wants to jump in, please, please cut me off. Uh, I think a big part of what the badge system allowed was for the youth to have a space within the school time to talk about what they were doing outside school or things that were happening in school that weren't otherwise recognized. It gave them a space to say, these are things that you're doing. This is the school talking to the youth. These are things that you are doing that we think are important, that we haven't had a way to reflect back to you in the past through any form of certification to reflect to you that it was important. So what the Batchism did that was so effective was tell the young people, one, if there's things that you currently think that are important in your life, we want to know about it, and the school is a place to address it. And two, there are things you're currently doing that we think are important that you might not have recognized yet, and we want to help you develop a language around it. Excellent. So it sounds a lot like um, some of the Red Flag Ground Badges talks about signaling. Um, and I think sometimes that's a really hard thing to understand. And what I really like about what you just talked about, which you just made explicit there, Barry, is that um, the, the badges which you issued signaled to third parties, for example parents or the Jewish community, that um, these people weren't just doing the type of skills which were traditional things in schools, but they were doing things um, beyond that. Um, and that signaled things to outside people, but also um, the other way too. So I really like that. And I just wondered um, if anyone else had some examples of those kinds of things which aren't usually um, valued in formal educational settings, but can work with badges, which would show to people who are a bit on the fence about badges the type of things that can be done which are valuable. I think you need to unmute. <laughs> it is. 
Yeah, if you're muted, unmute. I can't hear. That's are you talking? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> All right. Uh, go ahead. I, I, I go was ahead, just going. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to say that I think uh, Doug's uh, question or point there is, is an interesting one, in that uh, what we're getting to here at the heart is that there are various different stakeholders that would. Uh, whose kind of acceptance of badges is necessary for them to be kind of a, uh, a more transformative part of people's learning, right? Which is to say that you need kind of both the, the learner's acceptance of the badge, you need teachers, implementers kind of acceptance as to what the badges can provide there, and then you need the, just the general community's acceptance and understanding of what the badge is. Uh, and right. I think uh, that is, uh, well, so is it the acceptance of the badge or the acceptance of what the badge signifies is Doug's posted question. And I'm not, I'm not sure to what degree they're actually differentiated, but that's another topic for discussion. The, the other piece that I really wanted to add was that most of the kids that got the badges were the kids that weren't being recognized in other ways. And that was what I thought was really important. It wasn't the star athlete who's already going to be acknowledged many times for playing softball and basketball. It's not the girl who's always in the school play. She it's the quiet people. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say this, too, is that we actually asked a very specific question in a lot of the student interviews, which is to say, did you discuss these badges that you earned outside of school? Did you discuss them at home? Did you discuss them with your friends? Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't say it was a strong enough for us to kind of codify it as an explicit finding, but the majority of students were responded, no, they really weren't discussing this outside of like their formalized uh, uh, school environment or, or you know, their student, their friends that were associated with the school, which is not to say that that, that, that was a failure of the badges, but what to say is that uh, the majority of the, the value that the students were drawing from the badges was really an intrinsic value and less concern uh, you know, how that badge placed itself within their general learning community. And Sam, that for me is one of the things that I'm most interested in seeing what happens in year two. As I mentioned earlier, we changed the system that we offered to Epstein midway through the year. Beforehand, it was a, a, a wild mishmash of different tools, and in the end, it was a really sophisticated, integrated, uh, um, aggregated online social space. So wh when you, I hear you talking, what I'm hearing is the youth didn't yet fully take advantage of the social network within which the badges were part of as a way to connect with each other and share what they were doing with friends. That in part I think was because of when we did the transition t towards the, the latter third of the year. So I'm curious to see during the second year if we see youth doing more of the wanting to connect with each other outside of school and sharing it with, it with their parents and with their friends because there is an online space where they can now show what they were doing. That wasn't really something that was possible during the, the first half of the year. So this seems like a good opportunity to um, say that Sonny Lee, who um, works for Mozilla as well, has been um, telling me on the back channel that um, I need to say, <laughs> yeah, which is absolutely right, we have um, over, at the moment, over 70 independent organizations plugging into the OBI, um, and over 12,000 badges have been issued already, which is, given that um, this isn't a, um, like, people aren't issuing badges left, right, and center, that's still a huge number. So something else which needs to be made explicit, I think, which um, uh, was kind of brought out last week, is that the, there's um, the DML competition, which is um, uh, the MacArthur Foundation funding organizations to do stuff with badges. Um, so that's separate from anybody being able to plug into the OPI um, free of charge using open source um, kind of software and infrastructure. Um, so, yeah, so there's lots and lots of examples of, of people being able to, to do this kind of stuff. But the thing, and I think it's possibly a bit late in the podcast to, to explore this in any depth, but the thing which really interests me and the reason why I decided to, to give up a job which I really liked to go and work for Mozilla on Open Badges because is because as a teacher, I recognize that um, assessment is kind of the whole deal when it comes to changing education because if you change assessment, you have to change everything else. Um, because like it or not, people do look towards testing when they are teaching things and, and helping young people learn. So it seemed to me that Open Badges allowed us to have that question again in a meaningful way. So instead of just going, oh, let's just blow up the school and blow up the whole education system, thinking about reconfiguring instead and thinking about, well, what are the things that we value? What could be batch? Rather than here are some things that we have already and these are the things that we have to teach. So. Um, 
I think what we've been talking about on this podcast today is really, really useful in terms of thinking very carefully and thoughtfully about what it is that we want young people to do. And the example that we've had around Jewish education is a really nice and nuanced one. But I think there's lots of other examples, and indeed anyone who's listened to this might want to think about their own context um, and things which are currently being valued, but only implicitly, which could be made explicit um, and which might have a value to either the learner um, and or people outside that, like parents or employers um, or further training organizations. So what gets hard to think about? Um, I, and I'll, maybe I'm repeating here, but is that the more the student gets to to put their value into the badge, the more they negotiate, the more they say, this is what I value. Um, and I, yeah, I hear that it's been negotiated at Epstein in a really interesting way. Um, the less value it has on the other end, I worry. You, do you hear that worry? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying. So for it to, to for it to have value, somebody with with some, some power, uh, accreditation power, and so forth, so needs to say, yeah, we think this too. So that's why badges is kind of confusing to me at least. Can so, I can so, I um, mm -hmm. speak to that and then maybe ask a question as well that might mm -hmm. be connected to it? Um, one of the things that we're talking about when we talk about use cases is badges in a very specific situation and I love this example because it's got a lot of the qualities that I like about badges with Epstein. Um, there are other examples of systems that have to answer the question that you're asking by bringing in huge stakeholders. So for example some badge systems are working in school districts where they've come in and they've looked at how they can sync with a system that's already in place and it's so con context-based um, and there are places to scale it and there's ways to scale it but there's also some very particular things that are happening in those systems so the human systems aspect of it the government the the, the stakeholders the relationships all those things so if you start looking at it that way the validation or that piece that says this is going to mean something is really about the context that you're in. So Epstein, if you're not part of a school district, then you have one less layer of the human systems part that you have to negotiate. So one other um, piece of that when I'm thinking about it is if I were a teacher and I, w I was really interested in badges, if I wanted to see what this was like or participate or observe it or maybe start it in my school, I was curious if people here could talk a little bit about what the workflow or the workload was like to do that. Um, and before um, I stop asking the question, um, one thing I wanted to say is that um, the MacArthur Foundation funded iRemex and Barry, I know you know a lot about them, and they have a system where the youth are, are participating in meaningfulness of the badge and the creation of the badge and criteria and also validating and saying you, you actually met this criteria. And then there's another level, which is the, the mentor. And then there's a novel, another level, which is the expert in the community. So it's not just the students who are saying, we think that this is important, and we're going to give this value, and then you're going to believe it. So I just want to give a sense of the levels that are there and sort of the different shifting context. But in your situation with Epstein, I think just even in that use case that you're sharing with us, if you could give us an idea of the kind of overhead and brain power and relationship building and you know the effort that went into making that work in your school, I think that might be helpful for people to get an idea that this is not this is not an, an easy thing to implement. Uh, Catherine, I think your mic is off. <laughs> Uh, while well, we're waiting for her to come on, I'll, I can say real quick as a another use case, uh, the Global Kids, we've just started at the same time through MacArthur Funds to integrate badging into what we're doing. And we've had three different groups working. We've had a, a group of young people who are advising, a group of senior staff who are working from the top down, trying to figure out as an organization what kind of educational impact are we looking to have on our youth that can be badged. And then from the bottom up, program staff who are running particular programs looking at what badges they might need. And in that case, they're just both—they're pulling down from the top-down global level 
from throughout the organization, but also figuring out that are things that are specific to just them in their particular program, whether it's a theater program, an activist program, or a digital media program. And then that's impacting the, the global stuff across the organization. And all th those three groups, all of their work, then it works all together to inform the overall system. And it's a lot of work. Sorry, that, Barry, that, that system is really important. So um, th one of the badge winners in the UK, um, Tim Richards, who does um, support to reporter, um, that, that's a system whereby young people who enjoy sports um, can go and learn journalism and reporting skills to, to interview um, people who are involved in those sports. So um, they can level up and get badges and all that kind of stuff. But he talks about like Foursquare, for example. Yeah, okay, Foursquare haven't got open badges, but they have, have thought about the whole system. So what's useful to the end user, but also what's useful to the people who um, the organizations who are given the offers, for example. So you get a user who can check into, for example, Starbucks, um, but then the organization gets the loyalty, but also gives some kind of discount to the end user, um, and Foursquare gets the use and therefore the, the, um, the market value and all that kind of stuff. So, so everybody within the system wins. And I think um, Cheryl mentioned in the chat earlier that the badge system design is really, really important, and it sounds like you've thought about that really, really carefully. But I think sometimes when we're talking about, well, what can badges do? Well, badges can do anything you want because it's a technology. And, and what we're talking about here are using technologies to do stuff with people. Um, and so we need people to recognize badges is kind of the wrong question. We need people to recognize the things which badges, badges signify is kind of the right question. Yes, there's a technology piece to it, but we need it's the it's the recognition of informal learning and, and making that explicit, which I think is is kind of more important. So just to finish on that, um, we we t and this is the last thing I, I kind of want to say in terms of things that I really want to get across today. Um, we, we tend to, in Marshall McLuhan's words, we tend to march um, into the future through, whilst we're looking through the rearview mirror. Um, and by that, what he meant was we tend to use existing metaphors and put and, and do our, our current futures thinking through that lens. So we, we always use old metaphors. And that's inescapable. But the metaphor that I would like to, to use instead of um, like high stakes testing is resumes and CVs. And the problem we've got at the moment is that anybody can lie on a CV or resume and you can't necessarily show what you know. So therefore, with badges, you can click on them and get evidence and show people what you know in terms of that implicit um, and informal learning. I, I want to add one more layer. And now, in order to make this work, you're going to be hearing my voice, but you're seeing Myrna's picture, so that's really exciting. We're good. Um, but, uh, for us, part of it is the students teaching students because when you're working with middle school students and you're setting a high example like Ruth Messinger and you, they're going, but I can't do that, I'm not a middle-aged woman, but they can see you can be like her and look at the really wonderful, intriguing things middle school students are capable of. This student did this. I didn't know a middle school student could do that. How did they do it? And they can teach each other different skills, different systems, and so they're setting themselves up as teachers and role models to help perpetuate. Oh, get excited! I'm a little loud. Sorry. Um, to help perpetuate the system and get it going. So the startup is a little bit difficult and more labor intensive than we thought it would be. But when you can get the students going with it. And with, you know, we had great support from Global Kids keeping us doing this to show us how to teach the kids to use their technology. It's a little easier in the second year. I'm sorry, I get really excited. <laughs> oh, the hours involved. Okay. We thought it wasn't going to be very much. We all thought this was a little project. We were surprised. This was a major uh, project that was involving numerous hours for some of the teachers that were just heading committee, maybe a couple of hours a month. For the two of us that were trying to help Myrna brainstead it, how about an extra five to eight hours a week and just sort of depending on where it was going because we were generating forms. We were learning new technology and we're not young. <laughs> Do you, are your um the, you, you've been pretty clear about the badges. Do students also complete credits and grades? And oh yes, we have addition? a normal eight period day where they're taking Hebrew, they're taking Spanish, they're taking rabbinics and English and math and Bible. And I'm leaving something out. Science, yes. 
so you can tell English came right off the top, language arts teacher, but and technology courses for the sixth graders so that they know how to use computers and all of the other advanced programs that teachers want them to use in Hebrew and in English to demonstrate learning in class. So what's the relationship between the academic things and the badges? So. Well, like I said, we were hoping that making them stronger in terms of uh, their core character and their organizational function, executive functioning would make them better learners. But it's character, community, academics, those are foundation, and we see how they're all interlocked. So if you can create a child who, or, well, sorry, nurture a child, they've already been created. If you can nurture a child and let them see that you see the whole person, not just the math student, not just the scientist, then they'll perform better for you. When they say, you appreciate my whole person, and especially if you have those children that are um, 2E, you know, twice exceptional. Maybe they're gifted in one area, but they're struggling in your class, but they know that you really value them as a whole person, then they'll be invested in performing for you. They've got that intrinsic motivation to try harder or to try differently. Um, Barry had to uh, leave us right at 5 o'clock, and I want to give you last chance to give us, and, and Doug, I like your notion of is it too late in the, in the uh, webcast here to bring up a, a deep question, but I want to invite you to. So what, what are your kind of deep questions that we need to be looking at as we proceed? And we'll start with Barry, who might have to leave us right away. Thanks, Paul. Well, the first thing I want to say is I, I think you know, Doug started us out by saying, and, and answering a question you'd asked about why we're, there's so much happening now, and that we're only beginning to have the tools to explore what this looks like. At the same time, People have used whatever's out there, as Epstein has done so effectively to, to model what's possible. And I think both things are true. We're at a time right now that's very exciting where the most important thing right now is to be able to watch how organizations like Epstein and all the others that Doug mentioned who are starting to use badges are figuring out what to do, what resources are involved, what kind of organizational, what kind of internal organizational structures need to be in place what kind of voices and stakeholders need to be involved and what, what capacities so that organizations can understand not just how youth can use badges but how an organization using badges changes the way the organization does what it does. And these things are all very new for us. So I think it's very important that we not say there's one way to do badges or there's one correct way to do it, but that we're really open to exploring and looking how different people localize what's possible with digital badging systems, how everyone keeps the eye on the prize, and then learn together and keep sharing what we're learning. Amy, Lee work. Any final thoughts? Thank you so much, Barry. Uh, Amy, we don't hear you yet. You gotta unmute. <laughs> yeah, this has all been very interesting. I, I think I'm gonna have to think about it for a while. I <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's cool. I mean, because you've got like two different concepts. You've got the Mozilla open badges, which is going to be like credentials, almost like the portfolio that that Monica talks about all the time and then on the other hand you've got the use of badges trying to bring like acceptance of who the kids are into the school day and and stimulate their their growth like as an individual so yeah it's it's not like the that uses a lot more it's it's different than i thought it would be hmm. Doug thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight, no yeah. <laughs> um, I just I would um, I would encourage people to do two things. Um, the first thing I'd encourage them to do um, is to keep an open mind because what we tend to like to do, especially when it comes to technology, is to have a very strong opinion about things and then not change it. Um, and I think that an open mind is a good mind. Um, and the second thing. Um, is to, to focus instead of just always on the technology and um, which is important think of the badge system design and the human relationships angle um, and what it is that we're trying to do with education almost like what is the purpose of education and what are we trying to do uh, and, and try and think outside of the straight-jacketed metaphors that sometimes pervade um, conversations. Any from Anybody from Epstein want to have a final comment here? Uh, thank you, thank you uh, f for being such uh, pluckish at uh, 
yeah, getting this going, y'all. I um, appreciate it. It hasn't been easy enough. Monica, you have any thoughts you'd like to throw in here at the end? or? <laughs> Um, and it's, it's probably a little deep for the end, so I'm just throwing it out there, not expecting an answer. And I'd kind of like to direct it um, to Doug. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. I keep freezing up on my end. Doug, okay. on um, your site, you, you talk about XMind. And um, so I really wanted to know a little bit more about that. But I'm, I'm curious about something like XMind or the brain. Um, you, and, and we've talked about using tech um, to make us more human. So I'm curious about something along those lines, facilitating all this without us having to to prove ourselves. I mean, ha have you, that's that's my pondering. Is there a way so that we can just be, we can just do? The tech is gathering a trail of where we've been. I mean, there's different things out there like that. Um, but I'm I'm curious if the people in badges, open badges, have looked at that angle of now it's not even about me proving something or somebody labeling me as having proven something. It's the tech is there just to leave a trail. So yeah. there you go. Cool. Peter. <laughs> yeah, th there's, that's interesting because that. <laughs> One of the things that Doug spoke of at the beginning was this idea of what are his open badges, and he did a great summary there. And, and one of the things that came out of me during this conversation was that there's numbers of references to where badges can be earned, like Badge Stack. There's also Khan Academy has a fairly good collection of badges that they're uh, issuing. There's also Foursquare. And the one thing that the Mozilla Open Badges is doing is it's providing an infrastructure that's sort of badge agnostic, for lack of a better term, in the sense that what we're trying to do is, is allow these different ecosystems of way of issuing badges or designing badge systems to be able to support them all. So when it comes back to a student's backpack, they can bring in their badges from lots of different places. So, you know, if, if a student did a study of Egypt and then they, for their summer vacation, went to a four-square place where they were in Egypt, they could start to bring all those badges together from different issuers of badges and really start to look at, you know, creating their own sort of personal learning journey and start to recognize events that happen within that. So that's the one thing about the open badges infrastructure that they're doing is providing it to be sort of uh, agnostic, and I'm sorry to use that word, but I think it's an important part of it is, is that a lot of this badging is growing and, and is gaining popularity and different people are approaching it from different ways and, and Mozilla is really trying to make it so it's open to different badge approaches and, and different so come up with a standard sort of protocol or metadata structure for describing badges. That's more of a technical slant on this discussion but that's kind of what I'm here for. Really oh, thank you. And Sam, your last thoughts. Uh, j just that uh, I think uh, what's fascinating, maybe one of the most useful things about uh, badges is that it, all the different kind of topics and areas that we've been discussing and bringing these questions to the forefront in a very unique and specific way. There's um, a, uh, a, a, an educational uh, uh, policy theory called the boundary object, right, where, where by having an actual artifact uh, uh, that allows different stakeholders in educational learning and understanding to get around to talk, you know, true kind of transformational change exists. And I think badges, uh, you know, as a byproduct, uh, can, you know, there's so much they can do in and of themselves, but as a byproduct in bringing these topics of scope, of scale, of uh, learning, of assessment, of stealth assessment, of, of everything that we've been talking about, of integration with learning communities, of meeting to outside uh, un, uh, people. Uh, I think all of that and bringing that all around a single specific discussion of a, um, of, uh, of a pedagogical innovation like badges, I think that actually has a tremendous side benefit too. Well, thank you. And Cheryl, I'm sorry, your name is S, so you get to have last word here. <laughs> yeah, because we're alphabetical. But thank you for that great question. Like, um, I, I, and I'll repeat it because it's important to me. Like, having heard this conversation, what could a teacher do on Monday morning to kind of start doing something? Um, but so thank you for that question. Any other questions you'd like to throw us? <laughs> are, are you asking me if I have any other questions? Yes. Oh, I have many. <laughs> No, I, it's been a great it's been a great conversation. I I feel like 
this has been really satisfying to hear people who have actually implemented them. Um, mm -hmm. I, I the thing that I that happens to me, maybe I'll just make a comment and wrap it at that, is that talking to all of the grantees, I just come out of those conversations and I just feel so filled with the respect for how many different places we're trying to talk about badges being part of learning. So not just in K-12, but outside of that as well. This looking at what it means to learn and what it means to assess learning, what it means to shape your identity, what it means to craft a uh, reputation. All of those things feel um, to me like if we're just having the conversation about it, and I think that's the thing that's so surprising about the badges conversation is that it's engaging people um, to think about learning who I don't think would ever be having this conversation otherwise. So I just um, appreciate I mean, I could say many things about the different ways that grantees have been talking to me about badges, but um, I love, um, Elise said this last time, and I, I think um, Peter as well, that the open-mindedness to this as we're having this sort of big experiment and there's um, this moment in time, I think Sam mentioned that, like this, there's some sort of historical moment in time where this is just the right time to be having this conversation. It's just, it's great to be a part of it. It's really exciting conversation. Very cool. Well, thank you for your contributions here. Um, next week, we'll be back to 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, 6 p.m. Um, Pacific time. Uh, Fred uh, Mindlin from uh, California uh, is uh, helped organize a third space um, group of people, which which means gardeners and librarians and museum people who where there's learning happening outside of the classroom. And so we'll, we're going to be talking about third space learning next week. Um, so please join us then. Um, we're here every Wednesday, uh, usually five hours later, but uh, thank you all for coming this early. Um, over the EdTech Talk uh, network of the World Bridges uh, channel, the World Bridges network, and thank you to Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo for helping keep all that infrastructure in place. Thank you all, and we'll see you again. Good night. Thanks, everybody.